Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I love the numbers in the audience. Thank you very much for coming out. We're very excited about this evening. We have an extra special guest speaker. So we've got, uh, this is basically our agenda. We're devoting most of our time to uh, the presentation tonight very little business, just some announcements. And after the question and answer period and the break, we're going to do any brick walls from the audience. So if you have your DNA done and you've got questions for Morris, polish up what you're gonna say and be ready for it. So we had our conference this weekend up in Barrie, Tracks Through Time. It was very well received, very successful. And I'd just like to note that we had two of our members get 40-year pins. And that's Arnold Nethercott and Barbara Belch Nethercott. So congratulations to Arnold and Barbara. And at this point, I'd ask uh, Janice Carter to come up to introduce our speaker to us. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Morris Gleason, our guest for this evening. Uh, Dr. Gleason was born and grew up in Dublin, Ireland, and he's now based in London, England. He's a psychiatrist, a pharmaceutical physician, a sometime actor, and a genetic genealogy convert. He runs several DNA projects at Family Tree DNA, has several blogs, and has a YouTube channel devoted to videos on genetic genealogy with the aim of making the subject understandable and accessible to the widest audience possible. He uh, travels around lecturing on genetic genealogy worldwide, and I had the opportunity of hearing him speak a couple of times on the weekend, and I found him very informative, very clear and concise, very entertaining, and so enthusiastic about his talk that I'm sure you're going to enjoy him. Thank you. Good evening, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, great thanks to Nancy and to the Ontario Genealogical Society uh, Durham branch for inviting me to talk tonight. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is, and it'll come up here in a second as soon as I have uh, logged in, and I will steal your power, Nancy, as well. Certainly. That's that, and then... to this one here. Perfect. I'm going to talk to you about supercharging your genealogy with DNA. Um, how many people here have taken a DNA test? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Excellent. Okay, so that's about 20 to 25 percent of the audience. How many people here want to take a DNA test? Everybody else. Um, well, the good news is I brought, I brought a bag of DNA kits with me from London, England, okay? So if anybody does want to uh, do DNA testing afterwards, we'll have a swabbing session. It's always great fun. And uh, you can have your DNA tested, okay? Uh, so do uh, see me afterwards if anybody wants to come up and have a DNA test done. Now, I'll get these out of the way. Um, what else is there to say? Yes, we had a great time last week at the Ontario Genealogical Society AGM, and I met lots of uh, wonderful people, including some new cousins that I didn't know existed, because I came over to give a talk on my spirits, and there's a spirits <coughs> littered over Ontario. So I met uh, Roger Shire, who's a new cousin that I hadn't met before, and Bud Wesley, who is a new cousin that I hadn't met before. So it, was, uh, it made me feel practically Canadian. Um, <laughs> So it was great to be there and we had uh, lots of lovely uh, conversations with people uh, at the event. What we'll do today is we'll also have those conversations after this talk. So if you do have your own genealogical conundrums, especially if there's a genetic or Irish 
uh, aspect of them, then uh, do uh, formulate your questions and we will address some of your brick walls and roadblocks afterwards. Um, okay, so to start off with, here is a email that I received a, two years ago now from a lady called Pauline, uh, from the son of Pauline May Cartwright. And uh, he said, unlike people who are doing their tree out of interest, we have a specific purpose, which is to find out who my mother's birth parents are. Only this year, through DNA, we received a letter my grandmother had written in 1962, which a relative in Australia had kept all these years. She also sent a photograph of my mother's mother. So at the age of 84, she finally got to see what her mother looked like. What is it like to see your mother for the first time at the age of 84? Powerful, very, very powerful. Um, and she said, you never know what you will find. And this is the photograph that she got, um, which had been kept since 1962. Uh, the 84-year-old lady's name is Pauline May Cartwright. Her mother was Phyllis Ina Cartwright. Um, the family have said, please advertise these names and publicize them so that if anybody knows of these people, we are now on the hunt for, her, uh, for the father of this 84-year-old lady. You never know what you will find, and that is very, very true of DNA. Uh, you don't know if you're going to find out that you have a half-sibling that you never knew existed. You may find out that you were secretly adopted at birth. How would you know if you were a secret adoption? You wouldn't. It was secret. So uh, DNA testing is not for the faint heart, if you see. It does come with a government health warning. Um, another very useful and very interesting case was the case that happened in Canada this year where a um, Jewish man in his 50s took his DNA test and uh, came back, your ethnic makeup is 100% Irish. <laughs> <laughs> what? And they went back to the hospital records and they confirmed what they suspected, that in fact he had been switched at birth. And they actually managed to trace the another baby that had been born around about the same time, got him to do the DNA and his DNA came back and said, your ethnic makeup is 100% Jewish. <laughs> so they found out what had happened, but it just goes to show, just like um, the son of Pauline said in his email, with DNA, you never know what you will find. So you do have to approach it with a degree of caution, but it can reveal wonderful things to you that you never thought possible. So what we'll cover today is what kind of DNA tests are there and why would you do each kind? We'd all touch on a step-by-step -step approach to autosomal DNA uh, with examples specifically from adoptees um, because that is a, a particular interest of the group, I think. Um, what's involved with a DNA test? Very, very simple. You either swab your cheek or you give a little saliva sample into a test tube and that test tube is then sent off in an envelope to the laboratory. And in the lab, they look at your sample and they think, hmm, blue, must be royal blood. And they put it through the machine and the analysis comes out and the results are posted on your own personal web page. You have your own username, you have your own password, so only you can access it or anybody you share your details with. But not only that, they will compare your results with everybody else's results in the database. And each of the databases of the main companies, and there's three of them, we'll talk about them, each of these databases is approximately one million people. It's just coming up to one million people each. So that'll be three million people so far have done this type of commercial DNA testing. Now, one of the companies, Family Tree DNA, has created an infrastructure where you can actually set up your own DNA project. And this is particularly useful if you want to do surname studies. So if you're studying your surname, which will of course go along your father's, father's, father's line, then do um, think of testing with family tree DNA. It's a very, very useful way of researching your particular surname. So when you scrub your cheek or swab your cheek and uh, dislodge a little bit of a few of those cheek cells onto the swab, and that goes into the test tube, this is what a cheek cell looks like. It's typical of most cells in the body. You've got the cell membrane around the outside. In the middle, we have this great big green blob, which is the nucleus. 
And then these little blue things down here are the mitochondria. And these mitochondria contain their own type of DNA called mitochondrial DNA. And you have thousands of these little mitochondria in, your, in each cell in your body. Uh, so mitochondrial DNA is only passed on to you from your mother, and she got it from her mother, and she got it from her mother. So the mitochondrial DNA follows the mother's, 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 mother's line going all the way back in time. The other main type of DNA, of course, is this chromosomal DNA in the nucleus. And within the nucleus, you've got 46 chromosomes arranged into 23 pairs. You have two, uh, uh, you have two uh, chromosome ones in chromosome one pair, one from your father, one from your mother. You've got two chromosomes two, one of them maternal, one of them paternal. So that's how you get 23 of your chromosomes from your mother, 23 from your father. Now the last pair, pair number 23, which you see down there, those, that pair is also called the sex chromosomes. And there are two types of sex chromosome. There's an X chromosome and there's a Y chromosome. If you get two X chromosomes, you turn into a woman, like Bruce Jenner. Uh, <laughs> if you get an X and a Y, then you turn into Danny DeVito. So it's your choice, you know, I will leave it up to you. Um, and the Y chromosome is only passed on from father to son. And the woman only passes on an X, so the, the gender of the baby is actually decided by the man's contribution. The, the male sperm cell decides whether that baby becomes a female or a male. And the Y chromosome is only passed on from father to son. I got it from my father, he got it from his father, 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 just like the surname. So it's very, very useful for studying surnames. And that brings us to the three main types of DNA test. You have the Y DNA, that'll go back along your father, father, father's side, so that's one extreme of your ancestry, one extreme of your family tree. And that can actually take you back 338,000 years ago, back to when we were all running around in Africa, um, in fact, back before the emergence of uh, uh, modern, anatomically modern humans. So it goes back into the last great ape that we uh, evolved from. And it'll also take you back to the exodus of, out of Africa, the last big successful one 50,000 years ago, where uh, Africans left Africa and then spread across the globe to populate every single corner of the earth, arriving most laterally in the tip of South America 10,000 years ago. So why DNA is also very useful for studying these ancient migrations of humans out of Africa and taken together with linguistic evidence and archaeological evidence, it's been very, very useful for refining what we know about human evolution and migration during the last 200, 300,000 years. On the other side of your family tree, on the other extreme, is your mother's 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 line, and that goes back about 200,000 years with mitochondrial DNA. So this is also very useful for studying migrations from the female side. And most of the time, males and females migrated together. Can you think of any examples where the males went out and the females stayed at home? Wars, anywhere. Wars, any wars, um, Viking raids. So you'll find that, for example, in Iceland, uh, the male y, y DNA signature is Viking, but the female is English and Irish because they picked up the women on their way because the Viking women knew better than to go with their men gallivanting. So um, it's, it's very interesting. It does tell you a lot about these ancient movements. The bit in the middle is covered by the autosomal DNA. Now for autosomal, just and chromosomal. Uh, the reason why it's called autosomal is because it doesn't include the sex chromosomes X and Y. So autosomal is the first 22 pairs, first 44 chromosomes. Uh, but they throw in the X usually as well. So when you get an autosomal DNA test, you get all of the chromosomes, the first 22 pairs, plus the X chromosome as well. That's just to explain why it's called autosomal. Really just think chromosomes when you think autosome. Um, and that covers all of your ancestral lines, not only the male, 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 and the female, 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 but also all the other ones in between. 
but it has a much more restricted range. It only goes back about five to seven generations. So that's about 200 to 250 years from your date of birth. If you were born about 1950, it'll at the most take you back to about 1700, by which I mean you'll find matches on the DNA in the database with whom you share a common ancestor that would have been born around about 1700. So that's the autosomal DNA. Now, the Y DNA, the mitochondrial DNA, both good for deep as well as recent ancestry, the autosomal DNA only good for recent ancestry. And those are the three types of DNA tests in a nutshell. Um, from the point of view of adoptees, the Y DNA can identify the surname of the birth father. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. The autosomal DNA can help identify the parent, the child, and a variety of other cousins. And we're going to look at that as well. Mitochondrial DNA is really not of great use from a genealogical perspective. It's the least useful of all three tests. And it's not much use in adoption cases unless you have a very specific question. Is this direct female line connected to this direct female line? If it is, they should both match each other on their mitochondrial DNA. And that's really the only circumstances where you would use it. So there are three main companies that sell these commercial DNA tests. There's Ancestry DNA, which I think became available yesterday in Canada. Is that correct? Yeah? OK. And they're asking for $149, I think. Jack, you said $149? No, today. today. Today? Oh, right, okay. So it's hot off the press. Um, it's only 99 US dollars, just south of the border. So I don't know whether you can order it in the US, have it delivered to Canada, and then send it back to the US. No, I don't know. Can you? Well, I did uh, three or four months ago. <laughs> okay. And it seemed to work okay? Not Ancestry, family. Sorry, it was Family Tree DNA. Family Tree DNA, yes. They, they will ship anywhere and everywhere. Yeah, so um, that's the problem, is that sometimes there is a cost difference between Canada and the US, or between the US and other countries. Uh, certainly when it went on sale in the UK, um, it was going to be costing something like £119, which would be up around the 149 159 um, Canadian dollars level, um, partly because the, the shipping was so expensive. Um, 23 and Me used to cost uh, almost £200 in the UK because shipping was so much. Uh, but now you can get it for £125. You've been able to get it here in Canada for quite some time. And I think the price in Canada is roughly about 150 Canadian dollars. I think it's more or less the same as Ancestry DNA. And then Family Tree DNA is 99 US dollars, so that's about 120 Canadian dollars. Um, that's the database size. This is a bit of an old slide because now they're approaching almost a million in each of these databases. But it's interesting when you look at the percentage of US people in these databases because most of the people who have tested up till now are US. So for example, with Ancestry DNA, they really focused on the US initially and they haven't gone outside of the US until now. About 99% of their database is probably US based. But that will get less as more people outside of the US test. With 23andMe, it's about 90% of them are US based, 10% non US. And uh, with Family Tree DNA, only about 70% are US based and 30% are non US. Now, that can be very, very useful if you have uh, ancestors who came from England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and anywhere else in Europe. Because you may find, and certainly for me being Irish, I find most of my matches, most of my close matches, are on Family Tree DNA rather than 23andMe and Ancestry. And I've tested with all three companies. So I'm having most luck with Family Tree DNA. And I think, Jack, you were saying that you had more luck with Family Tree DNA? Or yeah. was it somebody else who was saying that? Well, it's the only one I've had so far. Oh, OK. Right. I think somebody else was saying two tests with 23andMe. And yes, that's right. You were saying that you get more hits on Family Tree DNA, more close matches. Family Tree DNA than with the other company, 23andMe. Um, whatever company you test with, you should upload your data for free to GEDmatch because that allows you to compare your data with anybody else who has uploaded their data to GEDmatch. And some people, about 10%, I would estimate, of people who have tested with 23andMe, Family Tree DNA, 
and Ancestry have uploaded their results to GEDmatch. Uh, so it does allow you to fish in three pools rather than one pool. Um, it also allows you to use some of the unique tools and utilities that GEDmatch has. So for example, if you tested it at Ancestry, you wouldn't have what's called a chromosome browser, which is a tool that um, 23andMe and Family Tree DNA have. So you would upload your data to GEDmatch in order to access a chromosome browser. Take home message is basically, it's worthwhile looking around to see what else is available outside of your testing company. So, as far as adoption is concerned, it can be an informal adoption, a secret adoption, an illegal adoption. Um, there may be no adoption documentation, there might be no clues at all. Um, I think that's happening less and less these days, but if anybody saw the film uh, Philomena, you know, you'll know that a lot of the time uh, children were sent off and the link with the mother was deliberately uh, not only severed but obscured by the people that were left behind. So, and that's what a lot of adoptees find, is that when they get their non-identifying information, it actually is quite misleading, and it can send them down um, uh, the uh, chasing after red herrings and send them down the wrong route. So in that kind of situation, DNA might be one's only hope of discovering anything. So let's look at what why DNA can do, first of all. And this isn't just for adoptees, but it also has general applicability to everybody doing their family tree research. And it's good for deep ancestry, surname projects, and connecting with cousins who have the same surname as yourself. And it can help identify the surname of the birth father. So here are some Y DNA statistics. Um, this is based on some information that I analyzed recently. Uh, some people, when they get their Y-DNA uh, results back, they find that they have thousands and thousands of matches because the genetic profile, their own particular genetic profile, is actually very, very common. And so it's not unusual for, say, somebody to have a thousand matches on, based on their Y-DNA results. And if you're just looking at 12 markers uh, on the Y-DNA, uh, about 29% of people will have about a thousand matches. Um, at 25 markers, it drops down to about 5%, and at 37 markers, you don't get that many uh, matches. It's not a 1,000. But the number of matches at 37 markers, about 23% of people will have no matches at all. So you might do a DNA test, and you might find that you don't match anybody. You have no matches in your list. Uh, so that happens about a quarter of the time. Um, about 51% of people will have, say, between 1 and 10 matches, 14% will have between 11 and 20 matches, and about 5% of people will have 21 to 30 matches, and a small percentage of people will have more than uh, 30 matches. And um, so it's, there's great variability in the Y-DNA test results. Some people have no matches at all, other people have lots of matches. Um, the NPE rate, now an NPE stands for non-paternity event. Uh, when I first heard it, I thought, does that mean the father wasn't involved? <laughs> um, but it's not quite that. I said, no, 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 that is not what it means. It means that um, it's not the parent expected. And this can happen because of illegitimacy, it can happen because of secret adoptions, but it can also happen because uh, a young widow, uh, she has, uh, say, a six-month-old child, she gets married again, uh, the children are given the name of the new husband. And therefore, there's an uncoupling of the Y DNA and the surname. And the Y DNA is from the first husband, but the surname is from the second husband. So that's another explanation for these NPEs. Uh, another explanation would be um, legal name changes. You will only marry my daughter if you change your name to Pennington. And this happened uh, with a, a particular ancestral line of mine. Um, the Spearins, they married into the Pennington family and I went in search of the Penningtons and they owned Pennington Hall in Moncaster in the Lake District in England and I went up to Moncaster Hall and I uh, looked around and I saw this old man pruning his roses and I said, you're not one of the Penningtons by any chance. And he was rather startled and he said yes. So I kind of explained what I was looking for and he said, oh well I'd be no good to you because I don't have Pennington Y DNA. I said, why not? Well, they made me change my name to marry Mrs. Pennington. 
if she's the Pennington, not me. I said, oh, okay, what about her father? Oh, there's no point in asking him, he's not a Pennington either. You need to change his name too. So, Pennington Y DNA had disappeared quite some time before. So, looking at the NPE race, just to get an idea, um, uh, I found a mismatch between the surname of the most distant known ancestor and the surname of the individual taking the test in about 15% of cases, which is quite high. But I need to go back and look at that again, because it could be that they were female, or there were some other explanations. But even if they were female, which would be about 50% of the time, you're still looking at an NPE rate of around about 7%, 7.5%. Um, and that's very, very high, because historically, the non-paternity event per generation is somewhere between a half and one percent. So after 20 generations, you'll have about a 20% chance that your surname doesn't come from the original person. After about 50 generations, you've got maybe a 50% chance. So um, I would say about a quarter of us in the room, uh, if you went back, you'd find that your, and it might be a very ancient NPE going back into the 1200s and the 1100s, but we may not bear the Y DNA of the person who originated our surnames. Um, the other interesting thing is that looking at this small sample of 65 men, I found that 10 of them had matches to their Y DNA that matched their own surname. So in about 10% of cases, the Y DNA, the surnames of your matches on Y DNA gave you a very, very good clue to what the surname of the individual being tested actually was. And that's very important because say for example, I'll give you an example from my spirit project. We had one chap join the project, he should have been an exact match to all the other spirits in the sample, uh, all of whose Y DNA was either an exact match or a very close match. Uh, his documentation went back to Limerick, perfect match for all the spirits, all the spirits go back to Limerick. We were expecting him to match everybody in our little group, and he came back and he did not match anybody. He only had three matches on his Y-DNA. The first match was Denman, the second match was Denman, the third match was Denman. <laughs> so this gives you a very good clue where the foreign Y-DNA came from. And he is now looking for records where a Denman was in close proximity to a Spirin at some point in time. <laughs> now, uh, let me have a look at this. Here is another example of, uh, uh, this was an example from Jamaica. And um, this chap, we call him Finbar O'Brien, the family, the family uh, lore was that uh, his father's father was a member of parliament in Jamaica called Massey. Um, and the kind of giveaway was that his father was nicknamed Massey. And he was also more light-skinned than the other brothers and sisters in the family. So he did his Y-DNA test. So remember, he is his father's son. He did his Y-DNA test, and when his matches came back, when you just look at the first 12 markers, um, he had Massey, Massey, Simmons, Massey, Simmons, Massey, Simmons, Massey. Uh, at 25 markers, he was Massey, Massey, Simmons, 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 Massey, no. And at 37 markers, he was Massey, Simmons, Simmons. Uh, so what this tells you is that his Y DNA was closest to people nicknamed, uh, whose surname uh, was Massey or Simmons. And this really reinforced this family lore that the Massey was the name of the grandfather involved. The most likely candidate for the birth father would be either somebody named Simmons or Massey. You might ask, why is Simmons there? Perhaps Simmons was an NPE, and there's another Massey further back that gave rise to a variety of different Simmons. So, or it could be the other way around, Simmons gave rise to the Massey. But either way, you know, for somebody who only had family lore to go on, and then to get Y DNA results that came back with half of the matches being Massey, this was a real um, reinforcement of what they thought they already knew from family lore. And it's the same with um, adoptees. You know, you might not know who your uh, father is, but if you carry, if you're a male, you carry the Y DNA of that unknown father. And by doing a Y DNA test like this, and I reckon in about 10% of cases, you'll get a very clear signal among the surnames of your matches 
what the surname of your biological father could be. Um, here's another example. I've just kind of taken my own Y-DNA and I've uh, anonymized it. This particular person is called Tim Cruz. And at 37 markers, and the 37 marker test is the standard Y-DNA test, there's a McLaughlin, a McMahon, a Gleason, a Neville, a Sykes, a Hart, and a Markham. Now, um, obviously my name is in there, but it's kind of obscured from, by the other ones. In that situation, what you would do is you would upgrade your Y-DNA 37 marker test to a Y-DNA 67 marker test, and at 67 markers, there's only three matches, a Gleason, a Gleason, and a McLaughlin. So in this particular situation, the most likely candidate for the birth father would be a man named Gleason. So sometimes you do have to upgrade your results from the standard YDNA 37. Here's an example of the use of YDNA in projects, and this is the Gleason Gleason project. I don't expect you to be able to read any of those uh, numbers at all, but just to give you uh, an explanation, and I'm going to use the, uh, the pointer here on the computer. These are all people in lineage one, and they all have a similar genetic signature. You can see that the green bits are exact matches. Uh, just to orientate you, imagine that this is the Y chromosome here, lying on its side, and these are the various markers along the Y chromosome. Each of them have a particular name. And then imagine all the Y chromosomes of everybody in the project are just stacked up here, one on top of the other in group one, and there's about, say, 20, uh, people involved in group one. All of these chromosomes stacked upon each other. You can see that there's a, a value of 10 for this one, indicated by this colored orange line. Uh, there's another line that goes down here. That's purple and blue. There's another orange line that goes all the way down there. Another orange line goes all the way down here. There's a few outlying mutations here and there that uh, just mean that it's a close match rather than an exact match. But this genetic signature for the first a genetic group is quite different from the genetic signature for the second genetic group. And the take-home message here is that with these, when you're comparing a group of people, you're looking for similar patterns among their genetic profile on the Y-DNA test. And this is what a surname project will look like on Family Tree DNA. So if somebody new joins the project, somebody called Gleason joins the project, we will compare their genetic profile and see if it matches lineage one, or whether it matches lineage two. There's another lineage, lineage three, and you can see that that has a completely different set of colored columns compared to the other two, indicating a different type of genetic profile. So maybe they belong to genetic, uh, to uh, lineage three. And lastly, um, these are the people in the unsigned, unassigned lineage, and you can see that it's really just a hodgepodge of different colors with no real pattern there at all. So when we're comparing people within a group, we're looking for a similar genetic profile, a similar genetic pattern that will allow us to say the people in this group are connected by a common ancestor that lived probably sometime in the last several hundred years. And that's why DNA is a very, very useful pointer. It will say, you and you are related. Now go away, find the documentary evidence that proves it. And that's what we did with my Spirin project. I didn't believe I'd match anybody else in the, in the project, but we did the DNA test on, on a, one of my Spirin cousins. He was an, an exact match with everybody else. And that took me from my brick wall at 1800 back to Limerick in the late 1600s back to London in the 1500s, and back to Flanders in the 1400s. So it takes you on the journey of your lifetime. Um, it's really exciting, and that's why I'm so enthusiastic about it. So let's look at autosomal DNA. Um, and we saw previously that it only has a reach of about five to seven generations, which is about 200 to 250 years from your date of birth. Um, it's useful for telling you your ethnic makeup, you know, what percent European, what percent African, what percent Native Indian, etc., etc. It's also useful for connecting with genetic cousins with whom you share a common ancestor, usually sometime in the last 200 to 250 years. It can be used for medical risk assessment, and anybody who's tested with 23andMe 
Has anybody got a medical risk assessment from 23andMe? Yes, we've got three or four people there. Yeah, great. I got mine on as well. Um, it's very interesting. It has to be taken with a pinch of salt, but it does make you circumspect about your own medical health and can lead you to make decisions about getting further medical advice about what you should do next. Um, we don't usually do, that's not available with family tree DNA or with ancestry DNA. They're largely looking at ancestry informative markers with those tests that they offer, whereas 23andMe is looking at medically informative markers as well as ancestry informative markers. And the other thing that you can get with some of these tests is they'll tell you what percent Neanderthal you are. Now, I would argue that I don't need to know that because I just look in the mirror in the morning and I think, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and like I said previously, no matter which company you test with, do upload your autosomal DNA results to GenMatch. It has a lot of useful tools and it has things like phasing, which we were talking about earlier on, which can be very useful too. I won't be going into too much detail on that uh, during this talk. But I take a step-by-step -step approach to analyzing your autosomal DNA matches. Step one is, where does the common ancestor sit? Step two is, is the common ancestor obvious? Step three is, let's eliminate non-contenders for the common ancestor between you and me when we match each other. And uh, step four is working with small triangulated groups. And uh, myself and Jack have some experience of working uh, in that particular uh, uh, group. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about each of these. But the first step, where does the common ancestor sit, is all about just positioning your common ancestor on your family tree. Because when you get your autosomal DNA results, it will give you an estimated relationship with your match. You know, you match Paul Hayes, estimated relationship second to fourth cousin. Okay, well, if he's a second cousin, then we would share a great-grandparent. And if he's a fourth cousin, then we'd share a great-great-great-grandparent. So that, it's important at that stage to kind of get an idea of where in the tree you should be looking. And it's usually a band. If you have your, 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 your family tree as an um, inverted pyramid or triangle, then it'll be that little band between great and great-great-great-grandparents. So it'll be somewhere along there. And that gives you an idea of, just keep that in your mind, that's where we need to look, both in your tree and in your matches tree. And that just it doesn't involve any DNA, it just, and, and that's the beauty of DNA, you can get as technically into it as you want to, or, or not, as the case may be. Because at the end of the day, the DNA is just a pointer. It's basically just saying, you and you, you're genetically related, you have a common ancestor somewhere, now go away and look for him. But the DNA can be useful if you get a little bit more technically involved in it at uh, telling you exactly where it might lie. So where does the common ancestor sit on your tree? Um, here's me, down here at the bottom, and here is, say, a third cousin, a third cousin match. Uh, so that would mean that we share a second great grandparent, and our connection would look something like that. I also know, being born around about 1960, that would give us a common ancestor born roughly about 1835. Okay, that's good, because the records exist in Ireland for 1835, just by the skin of my teeth. So there's a good chance here with a third cousin that I will actually be able to identify who the common ancestor is. Um, however, there are 16 great-great-grandparents uh, great in eight couples. It has to be one of those. If I go back to fifth cousins, I'm looking at 64 of them. So the task has become just a little bit more monumental the further back in time that you go. So this is all about placing the, the common ancestor. Where is he likely to be in your tree? The second step is, is the common ancestor obvious? And you'll only know that if you actually compare your tree with your matches tree. And to do that, you need, ideally, to have a, a tree available online. How many people have a, a family tree available online? One, two, three, four, five. Not a huge number of people. How many people have a family tree available on their own computer? Okay, a lot more people. And how many people have a, um, a pen and paper family tree? And that's all they have. Okay, a few people. 
Right. Okay. So you can still photocopy it and send it as a PDF to to your match, but ultimately you will need to compare your family tree with your match's family tree, and it makes it so much easier if you can either send them a link or send them a little screenshot of your family tree, or just one of those pay, um, one page uh, reports that give the, the name of the ancestor, the date of birth and death, and where they died, and where they were born and where they died. And that will be enough to uh, be going on with. Because what you're looking for with your matches is three things. Common locations. Did any of their ancestors come from the same locations as any of your ancestors? Number one. Number two, common surnames. Do any of the surnames that you have in your family tree match any of the surnames that they have in their family tree? And number three, the same individual. So a common ancestor. You know, um, John Ryan. I've got a John Ryan. Have you got a John Ryan? Yes. There you have, okay. Is it the same John Ryan? Well, it could be. Where did he come from? I don't know. That's, I just have his name. Okay, well, I mean, how many John Ryans can there be? So, you know, even if you have the same named individual, it can still be difficult to determine it is the same person. So, these are the three things that we look for in our matches. And it also means that you have to have your tree as up-to-date as possible. Not always an easy thing to do, because the family tree is a living, evolving uh, beast that uh, most of the time will spend uh, time on our favorite ancestral lines, and we'll ignore the ones that aren't as exciting as the rest of them. Uh, so, you know, it, you do need to keep it as up to date as possible. Now, DNA does allow us to eliminate non contenders, and this is where you can actually get into the technicalities of DNA. I'm not going to go into a huge amount, but just to let you know that the the technicalities are there, and there is there are ways of using the DNA to actually rule out certain people. So, for example, um, along with the DNA, you'll get uh, with the autosomal DNA, you will get an estimate of your ethnic makeup. So, mine comes back as 99% British and/or Irish. Great surprise there. I'm also 0.1% unknown, which I think is leprechaun, but I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I'm just coming up with theories, you know. Um, and I'm 0.1% Sub-Saharan African. So, I don't know how that got in there. It's not coming from 50,000 years ago. It might be a false positive reading, or I might have an African prince or an African princess somewhere in my ancestry. And if I do, I am going to find them. <laughs> I might have a nice little plot of land somewhere in the middle of Africa somewhere. Um, so it does, it does uh, throw up some very interesting findings. But it also, if you come from mixed heritage, say German, Irish, Scottish, and say South American, for example, then it will give you a breakdown of what percentage uh, your, ethnic, your DNA, which DNA groups your DNA belong, which ethnic groups your DNA belongs to. Uh, so that can be quite useful because, uh, say for example, you have Irish and Japanese, and one of your match says, oh, we're very, very close match, second cousins, and then you say, well, what percentage ethnicity are you? And they say, oh, 100% Japanese. Well, then you know it's not on your Irish side. <laughs> <laughs> so it can be very useful from that point of view, and if you're the only one that has done the test and nobody else in the family has tested, I find this very, very useful to actually honing in on particular lines in somebody else's family tree. I mean, I'm Irish, Irish, Irish back to about 1800. I'm probably not as Irish as I was, as I think I am before that, because I have a Simpson, I have a Morgan, and I have a Spearman, which is Dutch. Um, but if I match with somebody and they are, say, in the US, and they have German, and they have Italian, and they have Greek, then I'll say, well, it's none of those lines concentrate on your Irish ones. So it does help you focus on a particular group of ancestors within your family tree. A match on the Y DNA or the mitochondrial DNA. So if you have an autosomal DNA match, but they also match you on your Y DNA, then it could very well be that you are connected via your father's 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 line, going back up to the common ancestor, and they via their father's 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 line, going up to the common ancestor. If you don't match them, then you can rule out that particular ancestral line. 
So for example, if, if uh, Paul and Tom match each other on their autosomal DNA, but they don't match each other on the Y DNA, then you've ruled out that ancestor that sits at the top of their direct male lines. And the same is true for mitochondrial DNA. If you're a different mitochondrial DNA group with your autosomal DNA match, then you don't connect on the direct female line, because otherwise you would have the same mitochondrial DNA. A match on the X chromosome is quite useful, because there are only certain ancestral lines down which it can travel. We learned previously that uh, women have an X and an X, uh, men have an X and a Y. So for example, uh, for me, I will have received a Y chromosome from my father and an X chromosome from my mother. Now, if I match somebody else on the X chromosome, which side of my family will have it have come down through? It can only have come through my mother's side, because I never got an X from my father. So that's the beauty of having a match on your X if you're a man. It rules out your father's side completely. Already, you have eliminated 50% of the ancestors. And that's really, really useful. So a match on the X can be very useful. If you don't have a match on the X, it doesn't tell you really anything at all. But if you do have a strong, substantial match on the X chromosome, there are only certain ancestral lines down which it can have come. Very, very useful for eliminating non-contenders. You can also narrow it down to a specific uh, common ancestral couple if you test your cousins, second cousins, third cousins. You're related to your second cousins by a certain specific ancestral couple. If you get somebody who matches you and matches your second cousin, then you're 99% sure it has to come from those ancestors up there or from somebody above those ancestors. So it does narrow it down to a particular ancestral couple. And you can also do phasing of your DNA, and we were talking about this beforehand with GenMatch, where if you have tested your parent and uh, yourself, you can put in your parent's profile, your own profile, and they will, they will actually separate your DNA into the DNA you got from your father and the DNA you got from your mother. So that can be really, really useful as well. But you do need to have a parent tested as well as, as yourself. The goal here with all of these rather technical uh, exercises, which are interesting in and of themselves, is to get rid of your ancestors, as many of them as possible. Um, discard any ancestors who could not possibly be the common ancestor with your match, whittle down the numbers of potential candidates, and um, in so doing, same, you know, you can decide maternal or paternal, a match on the X, it whittles it down even further, uh, improbable ethnicity goes down even further, uh, and you can even with phasing your chromosomes, you can decide which grandparent it came from. All in all, it allows you to whittle it down to just a couple of ancestors, and that really helps you focus your research. Step four is working with small related triangulated groups. And the idea here is to identify groups who are likely to have the same common ancestor. So it's usually a group of matches. So for example, Jack and myself are in one particular group. We have a we match a segment on chromosome one. Chromosome one is the yeah. and so do 14 other people or so, about 14 of them. I can't remember offhand, it might not be that many. Um, but uh, as a group, we're trying to find out why do we each share the same or a similar segment on chromosome one. The theory is that we've all inherited it from the same common ancestor. So what we do is we all look at our individual trees and we're looking for common locations, common surnames, and the same named individual. So that's the, the exercise that we're still doing at the moment. But because some of us are actually quite distant matches, it might be back into the 1700s or even into the 1600s, and there is a question whether the records will be available for us to ever identify who the common ancestor might be. So, as far as adoptees are concerned, um, what adoptees should do is send their DNA sample into all of the DNA testing companies, and the results will come back in about four to 10 weeks, and if their parent is in the database, that'll be a 50% match. They match 50% of their DNA with this other person. If it's a half-sibling in the database, it will be a 25% match, uh, which is equivalent to 1,690 centimorgans. 
Essentially, organ is the unit that they use for measuring the size of uh, matching DNA. And if there's other relatives in the database, like a half nephew, it'll be 12.5%. A first cousin will be 12.5% 12, 12 as well. Second cousin, 3%. Third, fourth, fifth, and so on. Um, if you are an adoptee and you're going to go down these routes, have your letters ready. In other words, write out in advance what you want to say to your uh, biological parent if they're still alive. <coughs> have an idea what you want to say to your half-siblings because they have, may have no idea that they have an older brother or sister. So careful planning at this stage, um, trying to anticipate the sensitivities of the people involved is hugely important. And in order to do that, you really need to have your support network around you. So your family, your friends, even a professional uh, counselor would be very, very useful to consider if you are an adoptee in search of your biological family. If you are, an, for example, your parent was adopted, and I think we were talking about that um, just uh, before the, the uh, session here today, um, get the parents to, to either you, you, uh, so you send in your own uh, DNA uh, to all three testing companies, get the results four to ten weeks later. If um, your grandparent is in the database, it will be 25% match. If you have a half-aunt or uncle in the database, 12.5% match. And if there's an other relative, then the amount of DNA that you share, the more distant relationship it is, the, the less the DNA. And again, have your letters ready because you'll be springing a big surprise on these people who will probably have no idea that they are related to you. This is what your autosomal DNA uh, page looks like when you get it back. And uh, here's me here, for example, and it is, well, this is, um, supposing this is your name here. Um, uh, so you're an adoptee. Uh, this is what you get back. If it's a parent or a child relationship, you get a huge amount of shared DNA, 3,383 centimorgans. It also gives you, um, say, for example, a grandparent or a grandchild would share about 668 centimorgans. Uh, a first or second cousin would be even less, a second to fourth cousin even less, and a third to fifth cousin even less. So it gives you an, uh, various, uh, it gives you the amount of centimorgans that you share in terms of your DNA. Also, in this column here on the right hand side, if your matches have actually entered all of their ancestral surnames, you'll be able to see it. So very, very quickly, you can run through that list of ancestral surnames to see if there's any there that ring a bell with you. Here's a Dockery and a Gleason. This one is a Morgan and a Spearan, a Glennon, a Langham. And by just hovering over this, it will expand out into a whole list of surnames. If you click on the person's name, it comes up with their full name, their email address, uh, if they've done a Y DNA test, the results will be there. If they've done a uh, mitochondrial DNA test, the results will be there. What can be very useful is if they put in their most distant known ancestor. And mine was John Gleason, born about 1832. And on my uh, direct female line, it's Catherine Farrell, born about 1806. So this could be very, very useful as well. And then here below that, you see all of the ancestral names. You can see that they all come from Ireland. Some people are even more specific in name the county in Ireland that they come from. Uh, you can also contact them by email by just clicking on the email icon there, which is the envelope. So that's what the page looks like. The likelihood is, hood is that you won't find very, very close relatives in the database unless you're very lucky. It's most likely to be the more remote cousins, the first to second cousins, and the second to fourth and third to fifth cousins. But here's a practical example just to show you how DNA can be used in practice. And this is Jenny. Uh, she contacted me in, in January. She's 75 years old. She was adopted. And she said, um, I was raised with nine other children, and I always felt different because I was the only one that was adopted. And I've been searching for my adopted, uh, for my biological family for the last 35 years. I waited until my adopted parents died out of respect for them before I started my search. But I'm 75 now, and I feel like I'm running out of time. Is there anything that you can do to help? 
So um, she told me that the non-identifying information that she had was incorrect, that she had tested with family tree DNA back in 2010, and she had third cousins, fourth cousins, fifth, remote. She couldn't figure out how they were all connected. So uh, I asked her, have you tested with any of the other companies? And she said, no. I said, well, test with 23andMe, test with Ancestry, give me a shout when the results are back, and let's review the situation then. So she tested with 23andMe and Ancestry, and six weeks later she wrote to me and she said, you're not going to believe this. I've just found a first cousin match on Ancestry. Um, and I said, wow, that's fantastic. And yes, we've been on, in contact on Facebook, and uh, we've been sharing photographs, and the family resemblance is uncanny. And uh, she said, but I don't think he's my first cousin because I'm 75 and he's 35. <laughs> so it's probably more likely that he's first cousin once removed. And I said, yeah, that's probably correct, but let's, let's send me the detail and let's have a look. Now, of course, she didn't know at this stage whether it was on her father's side of the family or her mother's side of the family. So it could have been a paternal first cousin this is the David there, or it could have been a maternal first cousin. So we didn't know which side of the family was connected, we just know it was a first cousin. Um, so, and David being first cousin once removed, it was likely to be a generation lower, but we could be maternal, paternal, we still didn't know. And um, what we'd expect to find with a first cousin once removed is that people would share about 6.25% of their DNA in common. Um, and there's a certain range around that, you know, it could be 3.3 up to about 8.5, and those are the Centimorgans range down below. But when I looked at David's results, he came back as 9.77, which is above the range that you'd expect, and actually above the upper limit of the range that you'd expect for first cousins once removed. So, um, because um, he actually was closer to a first cousin, which was 12.5%. You'd expect 12.5% for a first cousin. And that's when I made a, a discovery. He wasn't her first cousin once removed. He was her half-nephew. He was a generation further up the tree, and that's why the amount of DNA that he shared with Jenny was actually greater than you'd expect for first cousin once removed. Now, we still didn't know he was a half-nephew on um, uh, Jenny's father's side or Jenny's mother's side, but what uh, we looked then for was we looked at the X DNA, and there was a match on the X DNA. Now Jenny would have got her X DNA from both her father and her mother because women are XX. David, on the other hand, could only have got his X DNA from his from his mother, meaning that we could now rule out. Um, let me just go back here. It meant that it had to be David's mother that gave him the X DNA. So we knew that the connection was via David's mother. It could still be on Jenny's paternal side or Jenny's maternal side. We didn't know. But the next thing we looked at was the mitochondrial DNA. And Jenny had mitochondrial DNA belonging to haplogroup H11A2. It just kind of, uh, a haplogroup is, is a genetic group of people with a similar genetic signature are lumped into these broad haplogroups, and they give them a name. And H11A2 was the particular name that they gave to Jenny's haplogroup. Um, we looked at David, and David also belonged to haplogroup H11A2. Now remember, mitochondria can only be inherited via the direct female line. Mother, 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 on Jenny's side, mother, 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 on David's side. So a possible line of descent of mitochondria would have been from Jenny's mother, who would have been David's grandmother, and Jenny's mother would have passed her mitochondrial DNA onto Jenny, and then passed it on to David's mother, and David's mother would have passed it on to him. So that was one, probable, one possibility. But the other possibility is that if it was on David's on Jenny's father's side, supposing after um, having relations with David's grandmother, he went on to get married, um, or having relations with Jenny's mother, whoever it was, um, he went on to uh, marry somebody else. And that person, just by chance, 
happened to be haplogroup H11A2. But how common is H11A2 in the general population? In other words, what's the risk of this happening? And only six out of 925 of Jenny's matches were H11A2. That equates to about 0.65%. It's very, very rare. So the probability of that happening by chance was only about 0.65%. So the most probable explanation was that Jenny's mother was also David's grandmother. And David got his mother tested, and then there was a wait for six weeks. And you know that those six weeks are going to be the longest six weeks of your life. And Jenny wrote to me and she said, I am on pins and needles awaiting her results. There have been so many disappointments and dead ends in my 35 years of searching. I am afraid to be too hopeful that his mum is truly my half-sister. The last few days have been such an emotional roller coaster, I think that I have run out of tears of joy. The results finally came back. David's mother was a 25% match with Jenny, indicating that they were indeed half sisters. So then she writes, the last few days have been overwhelmingly wonderful. I've had long conversations with my newly found half siblings. She had four of them. And we've exchanged more photographs. They say that the resemblance between our shared mother and me is striking. It's just amazing how this family, who a month ago had no idea that I existed, has embraced me with such love and grace, despite having to absorb the shocking news about how we are related. I am so very, very lucky. And she was indeed. And on that note, I'm going to end, because that shows you the power of DNA and how it can make a huge difference to people, and how it can also help you connect past your brick wall and find ancestors who are just waiting out there to be discovered. Thank you very much.